Whenever we give tours of our cathedral churches or our parish churches for various Greek festivals and things like that, or school groups who may come in, whatever the case may be, this, of course, is a very mysterious place to those who have not been raised in or are otherwise not familiar with the Eastern Orthodox Church and the way that we express our life in Christ architecturally. And so typically there will be questions about the various icons and invariably an icon that will trigger people's curiosity is a beautiful icon of the Platitera, y Platitera ton Uranon. And so it takes a bit of patience and some time whenever we're giving tours of our cathedrals uh, to explain what these icons mean. Now we understand that to many Western Christians and living here as Eastern Orthodox Christians in the Western world, there is and will always be that disconnect. They will not typically understand us unless they choose to try to understand us, I suppose, and we them. So when they see the icon of the Theotokos behind the altar, they're sometimes cast in confusion. Why is it that you have this icon of the Virgin Mary in this high place and what does that name mean? There was once a church tour many years ago in another parish and there was a fellow who was giving the tour on behalf of the community and there was a question and answer that came afterwards and someone asked this, this fellow what the icon meant and he knew enough to say, well, it's called the Platitera. Well, what does that mean? And he wasn't really sure. So he said, well, the Theotokos is a, a platter of goodness. <laughs> no, that's not what it means. Y Platitera ton Uranon means more spacious than the heavens. It is an incarnational statement to us. That we refer to her as a Theotokos is not a Mariological statement, it is an incarnational statement. It was to protect the truth of the incarnation of the God-man of the Theanthropos, Jesus Christ, that it was decided to always refer to her by this appellation Theotokos. And in everything, the Theotokos is for us an example of salvation. The Virgin Mary is an icon to us, an example of how to be saved and how to find the heavenly kingdom. We as inheritors of the divine legacy of our faith, expressed in the holy tradition of the church, understand a good many things about her life. That she was a child that was gifted to Joachim and Anna, who were barren and who in approaching the temple could not give certain gifts to the temple because they were barren. At a time when being barren and having no children was seen as a very great scandal and perhaps even a sign of God's disfavor in a couple's life. Joachim and Anna, being very pious people, committed themselves to fasting and to praying for 40 days apart from each other separately, and each received consolation from God by the Holy Spirit and angelic messengers that they would conceive a child of great promise. And so it is that the Virgin Mary is born to them and is consecrated to God. When she is brought to the temple at the age of three, Joachim and Anna, understanding that their time on earth was very short, she ran up the, the steps of the temple and she's received into the temple where she is raised until she comes of age. I remark upon this many times in various homilies, particularly those having to do with how to raise our children so that they have a lively and a robust union with Jesus Christ and a faith that will sustain them through the challenges of their lives. And it is really very simple that just as a Theotokos was raised in the temple, so too must we see to it that our children and that we ourselves are raised and reared and properly contextualized in the church. Father Alexander Schmemann wrote famously that we are not so much homo sapiens as we are homo adorans. We are built for, designed for, and purposed for prayer and worship to the God who gave us life. And so she is raised in the church. We see in the Theotokos that as she came of age that Joseph was the one chosen by Lot by putting his staff into the pile that was drawn out of the pile, that he was the one who was to be her betrothed and her protector. 
Although it's also important for us to understand that in the tradition of the church, they were never wed. He remained her betrothed, he remained her protector, and that, that union between them was never physically consummated because her purpose was other. We see that when she is weaving the veil for the temple as a young maiden, that the archangel Gabriel appeared to her by the well as she was going for some water and said, Hail, highly favored one. And the Theotokos is not surprised to see him because, again, according to the divine legacy that we have received, she got to know him very well in Gabriel bringing to her manna and heavenly food to eat because she was a consecrated vessel. And so he calls out to her, Rejoice, highly favored, when the Lord is with you. And then he explains to her her role in the salvation that is to come. It was to her that the gospel was first preached. Is it not true that the Annunciation feast that we celebrate is called Evangelismos? Because the Evangelion was preached to her first. She is the one who first responded to the gospel. And she did so in such a way that we should emulate. Be it done unto me according to your will. Even though she understood that in her context, in her place in history, that to become pregnant, she was told that she would conceive the divine son, the God-man Jesus Christ, and bring him into the world, that to do so, even without human agency, was to invite a death by stoning. It was a great scandal. We see that again and again she pondered these things and hid them away in her heart. We see that she gave birth to the divine Christ child in a manger in Bethlehem, undertaking that journey when she was very pregnant and quite uncomfortable. Again and again we see in her life that role of platitera y platitera ton uranon. And that birthing of Jesus Christ within her is also itself an image of how we are going to find salvation. Jesus Christ must himself be incarnate within the very depths of our being. He must be born in us in everything that we do and say and think and intend. Because the life in Christ and salvation comes about by that rebirth. It is an internal regeneration. And just as we see him enthroned on her lap, as a king of glory, so too must Jesus Christ be enthroned within us in the deepest places of our being so that there is and can be no separation between us and him. We see at the wedding feast of Cana, she gives us very good advice when the wine had run out and she goes to him and says, son, they have no wine. And he says to her, what business is that of mine? My time is not yet come. So she goes to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you to do. That is very good advice in our Christian life. Do whatever Christ tells us to do. And we see then out of that obedience, because to obey is better than sacrifice. As the prophet Samuel once said, out of that obedience, a, a multiplication of blessings ensues. We see that she was with her son and our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, from Bethany to Jerusalem, through the events of Holy Week, to Gabbatha, to the pavement, to Golgotha, to the cross. Of course, as his mother, she would never abandon him. We see from the cross that Jesus' arms stretched out moments before he offers himself up to the grave voluntarily so that he might destroy death for us on our behalf. He looks and says, Woman, behold your son. It is in beholding the crucified Christ, as did Mary, that we can find remission of our sins. It is a sad statement today that for so many religious people who have an affectation for, perhaps a rather casual affiliation with a particular church, that there's no cross present in their life unless and until we have knelt at the cross before the crucified one to confess our sins there is and can be for us no salvation no hope of everlasting life only an empty shell of a religiosity that will not only not save us but will make us in fact quite miserable 
She's there to witness the death of her son. She takes him to the tomb, as we do on Holy Friday evening, as we go through the events of Holy Week. She's there when he reveals himself as the Lord of life, the Lord of glory, as the one whom the grave could not hold, as the one who smites death for us and unites us to himself and makes it possible for us through him to know God. We refer to her, to the Virgin Mary, as the mediatrix of our salvation. We never refer to her, as Western Christians sometimes have of late, as the co-redemptrist. To say that much would be to say too much. It would be to accord to her an honor that is not proper to her. But we do refer to her as the mediatrix of our salvation. One of our writers said that the purpose of the Old Testament and all of Israel was to produce the Virgin Mary so that God could come into the world through her courage and through her acceptance of his holy will. <coughs> Finally, we see in today's feast the promise that awaits each of us. We see in the icon of the Platitera the Christ child in her lap, and she as a mother is holding him and nurturing him, nourishing him from her breast. We see in the icon of the Chimesis, Chimesis Tisteotoku is the proper title in Greek for this feast, of the falling asleep. Why Chimesis? Because she's asleep. That's why we have Chimitiria, cemeteries, where those who are sleeping lie, awaiting the general resurrection. And we see in the icon that it is now Christ who's holding her, her spirit as a swaddling babe. And because she was a mother of life and the mother of glory, he was not content to leave her in the grave, but bodily assumed her into heaven, as he will do for each of us who die, as he said in John chapter 5, who die believing in him, over whom there is no judgment, but who pass from death unto life. It is important for us to understand the message of the gospel that is represented in the life of the Virgin Mary and not to be confused by these bizarre Gnostic strains that we hear so popularized these days. Not to be confused by these originistic myths that would suggest that salvation is a guarantee so don't get too excited about anything. If we're curious where we are on the path of salvation we can look into the life of the Theotokos and the Virgin Mary, so that in that sense, each of us become Theotokos. Each of us bear God. Each of us give witness to his, his life, his strength, his salvation, his power, his love, his mercy, his tenderness, his desire to save, his desire to embrace, his desire to forgive. I'm very grateful to God in his economy that this is the day we can begin to come together again. It is altogether fitting and proper by her intercessions that we are here today. And beloved, if we as a nation, and I say if, if we as a nation, if we as parishes, if we as an archdiocese, if we as Orthodox Christians are to find our way through these challenging times, that I believe have perhaps only just begun. It will be through her powerful intercessions for us. And in following her example through our own intercessions for one another and petitions to God with humility, with repentance, in silence, with tears, with that same softness of heart as we see in the life of the Virgin Mary.